se llama Chris Knappman, es un experto en arboricultura de Escocia y tiene un diploma profesional avalado por la RFC en arboricultura. Eh, además, pertenece a la Asociación de Arboricultura, eh, Arbi Arboricultural Association, Farbor A, y también pertenece al Asian Tree Forum y al Asian U Group. Uh, my name is Chris Knappman. I'm a tree uh, consultant specializing in heritage trees. I'm from England, but live in Scotland. Okay, so yes, and in August I was uh, very honored. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll just stick on that slide for the moment. Uh, I was very honored to be invited to come to Spain to contribute to the Bacata Life project and also to see some of your wonderful monumental trees. Um, and I was very inspired by the Castanea and the culture of the Castanea in northwest Spain, in Castilla y León, and in particular in uh, El Bilso region. So, yes, I was very inspired and um, this is um, what I would like to share with you. So, first of all, um, some chestnut trees. Uh, the best friend on earth of man is the tree. When we use the tree respectfully and economically, we have one of the greatest resources on the earth. So, as I'm sure you've discussed at length, the, the economics and value of tr the tree for, for products and, um, and materials, um, that is the the utility of the tree and that's what frank lloyd wright uh, the american architect was talking about so yes so we have working trees we also have orchards and uh, when i say working trees i'm referring to the trees which are cut above the browsing line for products and of course there are also orchards of chestnuts and of course i know that um that Castilla Leon is the second largest uh, chestnut producing area uh, in the world after Galicia, I believe. Um, so we also have uh, landscape value and intrinsic beauty of trees. So a fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees, only a green thing, raw material at the service of utility. So we have to try and balance the usefulness of trees, what they give to us, and their aesthetic beauty. Um, the ABC, the aesthetics, uh, uh, the um, biology, and the culture, the ABC, we have to balance those things together. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Monty Python and what, what have the rovers ever done for us, but I was most inspired to see uh, the Ruina Montium uh, Las Medulas. So uh, the mountain was collapsed to get the gold, and uh, but that has created, um, say, uh, one to two thousand years later, this fantastic undercliff um, environment. This is an ancient man-made landscape, and it looks a very special landscape. I have not been into it, but uh, it certainly looks very interesting ecologically. And uh, there may be some giant and monumental trees in that ecosystem. Next slide, please. Yes, and here's another view of it. And next one. And yes, this, this, this cliff face, which looks a bit like an elephant or a, or a, a large with a, or a large nose, or perhaps. So this is the Ruina Montium. So a chestnut landscape. And yes, sustainable agri-silviculture. Um, sustainable and versatile production. So you can see it's very important and it, it, it's very embedded in the culture of Northwest Spain. We have, we have timber for construction, for furniture, wood for fuel, we have food, we have nuts, we have honey. And here are just some examples of that from uh, my visit. And, and of, of course, I, I only had a few days to, to sort of understand the culture of the chestnut. But uh, um, in, in England, we have apple days and we have a big culture around the apple tree. Um, so it's it's a similar thing, and, and these cultural links are very important. Next slide, please. And But of course, there are threats to that, and the biggest threat really is rural ab abandonment and depopulation, where the trees not being worked so, more, so much. We've lost 
perhaps sort of traditional skills, uh, reduced demand for products perhaps, um, pests and diseases that also need to be considered. But there are opportunities. We have festivals, cultural connections, green tourism, sustainability, increased awareness, uh, aesthetic beauty, biological value and cultural factors also. But, um, and an, an opportunity is our uh, is, is the inspirational monumental trees of northwest Spain. Next slide, please. And there, the, there were two particular trees I, I went to see, and one of these was the Castano de los Rojos en la Valina. Valina. Uh, and it resembles more of a rock than a tree. It's 16.2 it's, uh, metres around. Um, a culturally important tree, a Republican Civil War hideaway. Um, but of course, that's only recent history. Um, the tree is perhaps a thousand years old. Um, I think if you were making a list of special trees in the world, um, this is one of those largely unknown trees, which would, you know, could be included in that. I would say this is a tree which is internationally important, but little known about. Um, so this is one of the trees I, I went to see and um, to give some views on for, for management. Uh, one, one issue is that we have Mediterranean, secondary uh, Mediterranean forest emerging around the tree. However, it is not heavily shaded at the moment compared to, say, other trees. And yes, uh, it has a tree spirit within it. It has a face with it, as you can see. And I am assured that the face was not sort of artistic license this has just naturally occurred and which reminded me very much of animism um, in the Shinto religion where trees rocks everything has a spirit within it and, and this tree certainly had a lot of character and a lot of spirit and here are some more views of it so you can get an idea of the hollow which was the hideaway for the uh, rojos um, you can also see there's sprouts at the bottom of the tree and um, there was no actual tree work needed on this tree. It's, was, it's a very broad tree, massive stem, um, but not a very big crown, although there were pole stage trees growing from its base. Um, so no, no tree work necessary. Monitoring for the oriental chestnut gall wasp uh, for infestation. Um, and I would say it's in very good condition for its age. We have to consider condition for age. We cannot expect an ancient tree to look like a young tree, uh, any more than we can expect an old man to look like a young man, but there might still be a lot of vitality uh, within within it. Um, so yeah, um, and there are dynamic processes of decay and renewal, and, and sweet chestnut, Spanish chestnut, is very good at um, reinventing itself uh, from sprouts from the base of the tree and off the side of the trunk Next slide, please. And here's some more views of it. And um, yes, I, I understand that um, there is a, a move from uh, the local village to perhaps begin to put this tree on the tourist map. Of course, we want to share trees with people, we want to enjoy them, but we certainly don't want to have too much pressure on the tree. Um, and if on the right hand slide, you can see some young chestnut trees there. Um, I felt it was a good idea to perhaps remove these because they block people taking photographs. Now, by doing that, you might prevent the trees situated on a slope. You might prevent people from climbing around the tree so much because they can get their photograph from in front of the tree. They get a better view of the tree. So um, we felt there were some improvements to the setting of the tree, which would be valuable um, to maybe also tip prune growth from adjacent trees, but it wasn't heavily shaded, um, and also tip prune younger stems originating from the same tree where it was shading the older parts of the tree um, and also where necessary to halo the tree this is removing some of the younger trees around the edge of the canopy so they don't put the tree into shade and um, of course the younger trees have far more vigor and can overtop the tree and, and uh, shade it out so 
Um, also, there are further opportunities to research the tree heritage story, uh, install an interpretation board, perhaps, on its history, um, and, and so a number of ways to celebrate the tree. This tree actually isn't designated as a, as a monumental tree, and um, I certainly think it would be uh, a very strong contender for that designation. So next slide. And I've just included this, I won't give you the whole slide of this, but this is a, a Scottish tree under which Oliver Cromwell camped. Now, Oliver Cromwell, of course, was uh, strongly involved in the English Civil War, and he did get, a, get up to Scotland. Um, uh, of course, he wasn't particularly popular in Scotland. However, this is Cromwell's tree in Scotland. This is a sweet chestnut with uh, loads of lovely dead wood for the insects and the birds and the perch for the birds of prey, but still a little bit of growth uh, at the bottom. And that's what happens with old trees. They often grow down, but produce vigorous growth from down below. So this is a, I thought it was quite interesting. It's another civil war tree in another country. Um, so a bit of a connection there. Next slide, please. And the uh, second tree I had to look at was Castano El Campano. Uh, in uh, Villa de Acero. And um, yes, this, uh, by, by contrast, this tree does need some work. Uh, we can see a, a nice uh, photograph uh, of the tree in a chestnut frame. And on the right hand side of that uh, picture, you can see a stem which is torn out from the tree um, recently. Um, this is a monumental tree and designated. Um, one of the largest in Spain, uh, a patriarch uh, of Roscoe. And it has a good physiological condition, but is poor structurally. So that's quite interesting. Uh, it has three main stems. One has recently failed to cubical brown rot. Um, and remaining stem starting to split with the degradation of cellulose and delamination caused by the fungus Fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak fungus. Um, there's a large central cavity with stonework and a substantial tear out, which has created dead habitats, um, which would be valued by certain insects, perhaps clip beetles, that sort of thing. Um, there is a very distinct secondary crown at about eight meters. Um, so there are opportunities for management here. Next slide, please. And here's some more views, so you can see where the stem has torn out on one side. You can see a nice uh, a pole of dead wood on the right-hand side. You can see the um, shard of, of wood which is torn out. You can also see a bit of the mycelium in that. And you can also see the stem which is torn out. And that's really important with old trees, which may be important for, for insects and beetles, that um, the old stems are retained near to the tree. Uh, you do get different um, uh, different groups of, of uh, insects in fallen dead wood compared to standing dead wood. Um, but, uh, and there may be some which could inhabit both of those. Next slide, please. And here you can see inside the cavity, you can see the mycelium, you can see the cubicle rock, and this is a slow-acting fungus, and it takes a long time to get to the cambium, but that combined with loading on the end of the stem eventually causes breakage. But as we have seen, the tree can respond very well from producing epicormic growth, adventitious sprouts, um, which enables the tree to reinvent itself in its own time. Now, if we did nothing at all, the other two steps would collapse, but the tree would still grow from the base and would become a different tree. However, if we want to preserve some structural integrity, integrity, standing dead wood and aesthetic value, we maybe need to do something to, to achieve that. So next slide. And oh, you can see inside here, you can see an aerial root. Trees often, many trees can do this, produce aerial roots. Um, and uh, they're not true aerial roots, you only get that in the, in the tropics on tropical trees, but um, they can produce growth the side uh, from the cambium. And when it hits the ground, it will cause a root. And above ground, it will form a stem. And in and some trees, and new trees in particular, are very good at this, they can recycle themselves. 
next slide. And here's here is a view of the uh, the stonework, which uh, doesn't do anything for the structure, but of course is culturally interesting. Um, my recommendations were to re reduce the remaining two stems to approximately eight meters above ground level, pruning to suit growth points, um, and then that would enable pollarding cutting on a five to ten year cycle. Um, also, there was a semi-mature pole, which can also be reduced to eight metres. So you're changing the form slightly, but keeping structure. Um, it'd be very important to use experienced tree surgeons. It's potentially a dangerous job and a difficult job. Maybe use a uh, an all-terrain uh, work platform, mobile work platform, if it's possible to get one in there. Um, and uh, consider coronet fruit. Maybe not cutting, cutting the uh, cutting off straight, cutting like a crown, so uh, it it weathers more naturally. That's another possibility there. Um, so um, as for landscape work, yes, yeah, obtain fallen stem around the tree and and perhaps carry out dendrochronology research on the failed stem section to get an idea of. Uh, the age of the tree. So there is scientific work which could be done on that fallen section. But um, a tree which needs some work if we don't want the other two stems to collapse. And if we move to the next slide, we can see, um, you can see examples, you've got dead tissue, cracks, you can see the fungal activity in those stems. They're very visible from outside. Okay, and the next slide. And so, so I've shared some of your own trees with you, which I'm sure you know quite well. Um, but I also want to, I, I was also inspired by um, the fact that uh, Northwest Spain is kept big for the Azurian Celts. And of course, that is strong links to Brittany, the southwest of England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And so I wanted to share some other trees with you. And this is the, uh, the Tortworth chestnut the most famous chestnuts in England. And you can see the beefsteak fungus on the right here. One tree has become a whole woodland. It has layered branches. Branches have hit the ground and rooted in. And the slide on the left, you can see that it has created new trees have grown around it. Um, this is perhaps the closest tree we have to the, uh, the tree on Mount Etna, which we shall come to in a minute. Next slide, please. Yes, and here more views of it. And the next. Yes, and uh, this is an older picture. And if you look at the top left of the main stem, the old stem, uh, and then look at the next slide, you will see that, that bit is now broken out. So trees are going through dynamic change all the time. Bits break, new bits grow. But sweet chestnut has certainly got many advantages in being able to reproduce itself. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the sign with it, and there's a, a nice bit of poetry about the tree. And moving on to the next slide. So yes, Etna, the Colossus of Sicily, uh, Castagno di Senti Cavalli, a tree which is rumored to be 2,000 to 4,000 years old, Mount Etna, which has managed to escape the lava and eruptions for all that time and is still surviving. And uh, if you look to the, uh, the artwork to the side, there you can you can see uh, from the top picture. You probably I think you can probably see the section which I have photographed here. But again, like the Torworth chestnut, many sections, but they, this apparently has all been proved to be one tree which sheltered um, a queen of Aragon and a hundred horsemen um, a few hundred years ago. So you can see all those different stages and it's still bearing, bearing fruit. And this is the view from outside. Next slide, please. Now we move to Scotland. And this is uh, an island in Scotland, in Stirlingshire. Um, 
this is an island called Inchmahom. I won't give you all the history now because I've I was so inspired by the chestnut that instead of doing a twenty minute presentation, I've now done slightly longer. But I hope that's okay with you. But uh, this tree here, as you can see, um, what happens is it's, it's grown on the edge of the island, and as the water levels rise in the Lugo, the the loch, um, the underwash tree, the tree has fallen over, but it is still growing. So let's see the next slide. So this is what we call a phoenix tree, a tree which has failed, but it still has root connection and the side branches start growing vertically. Those giant boughs wave around my aged hoary head, but then the tenants of the ground where walked the royal maid. And this island associations with Mary Queen of Scots, who took refuge there before fleeing to France. And next slide, we have, yes, two more of the Scottish trees, the oldest recorded planted sweet chestnut in Scotland, the 1550 sweet chestnut, um, from Castle Loud, the, uh, the castle of the clan chief of the Mackenzie clan in Scotland, a fine single stemmed tree. And on the right, another Scottish tree, the Balmerino Abbey chestnut, uh, which was perhaps planted by Mary Queen of Scots. Next slide. And this, I, I love this uh, picture. This is one of the stems. Uh, and you can see how a tree develops from a, a young tree to a, a middle-aged tree. And as it gets to the next stage, it is adding reaction wood. And so the shape is changing because it has to support um, increasing bow, uh, size of, of limbs and boughs. And this is a record uh, for the uh, 1550 chestnut of measurements taken. So there's, there's been a lot of recorded history of this tree, which is very useful. And some more from Scotland, the king tree from Dunipace. This tree is uh, was, uh, has gone from being a, on a country estate to a, a housing estate as the land has been developed around it, but it still remains and is a, a cultural focus. Um, and then another Mary Queen, Mary Queen of Scots has a lot of trees associated with her. This is Queen Mary's tree at Cumbernauld House. So this one is uh, rather interestingly called the bun tree or the bottom tree because it looks like uh, someone's sitting on top of a wall. And this is by the shores of Loch Lomond uh, beside the main road. There's a sweet chest up having a rest on a wall. And uh, this is probably the oldest tree, the Coven tree. A Coven tree was a trysting tree where the lord or laird would meet his guests beside the tree and then he would bid farewell to them by the tree also. And this tree has also um, been celebrated in, in paintings by uh, the landscape artist, by, by the impressionist artist uh, Turner. And there you can see the tree uh, um, as drawn by Turner. And the central core of the tree has died. However, this tree has, has regrown um, from limbs growing from the base of the tree. But uh, it still maintains the old hulk of the tree, which is certainly very interesting and valuable for wildlife and fungi. And of course, the fungi are very important in breaking that down and creating habitats. Dynamic processes of decay and renewal, uh, which is kind of important for the tree to develop to great age, so um, something which the tree needs. So a kind of symbiosis. And there we see the the, uh, the live bits of the tree and the, the dead centre behind it. So, um, and a final monumental tree from Scotland, this is one, these are the Roslyn chestnuts. These trees are suffering from trees growing up around them, which will surely shade them out and will actually kill the trees if no action is taken. Um, these trees are growing right beside the Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Um, when Dan Brown decided to write the Da Vinci Code, he knew that its finale would have to take place in the most mysterious and magical chapel on earth, Roslyn, uh, which is strongly associated with the Knights Templar, which of course is uh, quite an important thing in Pontefrada with the, uh, the amazing castle you have there. Next slide, please. And, and here is the chapel, and a bit of detail of this wonderful architectural features there. Okay, and the next slide. 
Um, so moving, moving uh, down into England now, in the Lake District, this is the ancient tree forum of Britain, um, on a field trip in 2012 at an amazing sweet chestnut up to 11 small in the Lake District. And we're not going to leave Wales out of it, another Celtic nation. Uh, this is a Dinnefer, which was uh, an old castle, um, which is now ruined and now there's a mansion. And this, uh, this fantastic tree here, only a few hundred years old, but nonetheless a fine specimen. And you can see the aerial route um, going down into its decaying centre as it, as it uh, recycles itself. And that will form a new and thicker stem within the tree and give strength to the tree. And this site is particularly important for the white park cattle. This is the closest thing to the ox, the wild cattle, if you like. Um, and there are only about a thousand breeding females, but there is a herd of, of uh, white park cattle at this estate, uh, which are an important element of, say, uh, wood pasture, this, this type of uh, cattle. And uh, let's have a, and, and these particular uh, cows are conservation grazers and they maintain hay meadows at this uh, wonderful site in Wales. And, and next picture, and a, a lovely bit of artwork from, uh, from, the, uh, from the cafe. Okay. And Croft Castle, Hereford in the Welsh borders. Now there's a bit of a Spanish connection with this. Um, it is believed that these trees were laid out in the formation of the uh, Spanish Armada. It's also rumoured that um, that the trees were salvaged from barrels of nuts from you know the wreckage of some of the ships from the Spanish Armada. So. Um, it's it's all fanciful. Um, no one knows for sure, but but uh, we have now a legacy of fantastic chestnut trees at this site, and there are hundreds of these. And just some examples, and the use of chestnut wood to make a small stage there for performances. And Devon, my home county in southwest England, the Killerton chestnut. You can see the prop and and. Uh, uh, I was going around the house, visiting the house, which is National Trust for England, and I found this lovely photograph from 1924, so nearly 100 years old. And you can see that uh, the tree has both its lower limbs and no prop. So sometimes it's beautiful to have uh, cultural records, photographs, um, stories about trees, which give us the clue to their history. And the next slide. And you see over the course of pre March 2016, May 2017, another small thing has fallen off the tree. But uh, this is all part of the process of change. And this is uh, just on the farm in Devon, and I don't know what this formation is about, but there are two lines of trees forming a point. And uh, unfortunately, they're suffering from uh, overgrazing and poaching around the trees from, from too many cattle. Um, but a, a very interesting and fine feature, but certainly some management needed to help uh, get these trees. And uh, this is Dart Hall in Totnes, um, and you'll see a Henry Moore sculpture here. Um, these chestnuts are, say, four to five hundred years old uh, on a medieval estate in Devon. And um, I thought it was interesting to do a close up of one of the trees because you can see where Henry Moore may have got his inspiration for his sculpture from the chestnut tree. And um, finally, Saltram House, um, a chestnut tree, nice cracks in this tree, may need reducing to, to stop it collapsing, possibly. However, a good habitat for bats, bats potentially. You can see dead wood in the middle slide, which has been heavily used by woodpeckers. And in turn, those holes may be used by other birds or by bats. And this is just an example of what we call a palimpsest. This is a layers of landscape where these trees were originally in a country estate and then development took place and suddenly they find themselves within a more modern context. Um, and this is about peeling back layers of landscape to, um, to find the history. And, and uh, it's nice that you have these old trees and they've got space. The, the tree on the right-hand side was threatened by a planning application for an extension to this health centre, but uh, fortunately we, we resisted it uh, when I was working as a tree officer 
and um, and they uh, found another place to do the extension, and the tree was saved. And that's that's the end of it, I'm afraid. But I uh, I hope you've enjoyed seeing some other chestnuts and heritage chestnut trees from England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and um, it gives another perspective and also shows some of the other management issues that we need to consider when looking after these very special trees. Thank you very much. Okay, my question is for Chris. Uh, what an excellent way to finish these uh, Bio Castania uh, days. Fantastic presentation from Chris. Uh, your, your passion uh, for chestnuts is very, very well uh, described in uh, his presentation. Well, my question is uh, what, to, what uh, in your opinion could be the oldest chestnut in Europe? How many ages? How many age age could have the oldest chestnut in Europe and the region in Europe where we can find it? And the last question about uh, the chestnut in Scotland. Usually, I am saying in my presentations that the uh, limit for uh, chestnut production is more or less at the south part in England. But now we are in Scotland. In Scotland, can we have nuts? Okay. Um, I couldn't hear you too well there, but um, I think the, f the first question about the oldest tree in Europe has to be the um, Castagno di Senti Cavalli on Sicily, on Mount Etna. And I know for a fact, now I, I didn't get to see this one, but just a short distance from that one, there is... Uh, uh, another chestnut, a single stem tree, but a massive tree called the boat tree, or um, uh, I believe it's El Nave. Um, so yes, the, the tree on Sicily is the, is the biggest girth chestnut. In fact, I think probably the biggest girth tree in the world, but of course it has changed much over time. I think at its, at its biggest and most intact, it was about 62 meters around that tree. And I, I didn't quite hear what you were asking about Scotland. Last question was about the nut production in Scotland. The chestnuts you show in your presentation from Scotland, are they producing nuts or no? Are they producing nuts? Is that was the question? Yes, this is the question. Yes, Chris, that's the question. Oh, yes, well, no, chestnuts in, in um, Britain do not produce nuts very well unless you get a long, hot summer. Um, in the southeast of England, in Kent, um, in Kent um, and along the side of the Channel, where you have a more continental climate, uh, they do produce nuts there. And they're also coppiced and have been traditionally coppiced there, um, possibly for use in the brewing industry, for fuel and what have you, for that. So the chestnut is is um, traditionally coppiced to cut to the ground so that stems can be harvested for fencing, chestnut pale fencing um, for estates and various other, and for fuel, um, and also nuts in the southeast. But in the southwest, we sometimes get nuts if we're lucky, but more often than not, they're very flat and inedible, I'm afraid. Um, not like your lovely Spanish chestnuts, so I'm afraid. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, for this uh, great uh, presentation. It's uh, a, a great opportunity. Mi pregunta es para para José Luis. Thank you very much. It has been a, a real pleasure. Despite the technical difficulties, the show had to go on, and we've managed to uh, we've managed to get the presentation done and I just have to say I was really inspired by the chestnuts in, in northwest Spain um, although I didn't see 
too many of them. I saw two of the most special. And But I was also inspired from a landscape perspective. And I'd also be very interested in the ecology of those trees as well, what beetles are living in them and, and those chestnut ecosystems, and particularly Las Medulas. Um, and, and, and I could see that it was a very important tree to the culture from looking at the buildings and all the other evidence. Um, and it, it really was a pleasure to, uh, to visit Spain and to, to make those cultural connections. And I, I particularly wanted to share some of those other special tr trees with you. And uh, you just gave me the opportunity to talk about chestnut trees, which I've been wanting to do for some time and to pull all that together. So thank you very much. A question uh, to Chris. Um, what do you think about ultrasonic tomography to detect decay in the live and giant chestnut? Thank you. Sorry, I, c I couldn't hear that too well. It was a bit of an echo. Uh, what do you think about ultrasonic tomography to detect decay in the live and giant chestnut? So about the decay, decay in the in the live and giant chestnut tomography, ultrasonic tomography. Uh, what do you think about using ultrasound uh, tomology to detect decay? What do I think about it? Well, I, th I think it has its uses, uh, tomography. Um, there are many other invasive and semi-invasive methods for um, looking at trees. I think we always have to start by looking at the tree itself before you get any um, kit out. It's important to do a visual tree assessment to look at the tree. Um, with El Campano, it was quite clear because we could see inside the failed stem, we could see the other two stem, and we could see from the outside what was happening inside, and we could get a fairly good idea on that tree. But in certainly on some trees, it is very useful when you can't see inside. But in many cases, you're using tomography or um, micro drill to confirm what you, you kind of think anyway. Um, it gives you a, a nice picture, but um, we can test, we can find out a lot by probing, by using a nylon hammer to test the sound to, to find out if it's hollow inside. And there are other methods. But um, one problem with tomographs is that it's often done in two dimensions. So you only see a flat section. Um, so you really need to do it. Um, at different places up the tree to see how that decay is in three dimensions. I think sometimes that is often forgotten. Um, um, but it has its uses. But um, first of all, work through the process of looking at the tree and what the tree tells you without, without the uh, machinery. Thank you, Chris.